I mean, very simply, the love of the, the music. You know, Chris's love of reggae is, is so evident in the, in the journey he took through his career and, and the artist he represented. And, you know, he was, until Jimmy Cliff left him, he was, you know, responsible for the hard, like, you know, the movie, uh, Pizza Tosh, Bunny Whaler, like Toots and the Maytals, like he lived and breathed reggae music. And his early career was spent driving around London with his windows down playing these unknown Jamaican artists and people would come up to him and like buy the album through the car window. Like that was, you know, the introduction to reggae in, in not only the UK, but a lot of the world was kind of a lot to do with Chris Blackwell. So I assume Bob saw that and saw a genuine love for the music, not just a kind of commercial uh, business one. I think they kind of, they trusted each other. Chris gave Bob and, and, and Bunny and Peter 4,000 pounds when they first met just to go make an album. And everyone else in the island office were like, Shock! They couldn't believe that Chris had been such an idiot, and that they would ne he'd never see the money again. So there was a real trust um, which they shared, and their mutual respect. And I think they got on. You know, like I read somewhere that they they spent a lot of time talking about the music and and the production, and they were like geeked out on the frequencies and tempos and all those kind of things. But they also spent a lot of time, apparently, according to Chris, just in silence. They would sit in each other's company and and just be with each other, which for me shows a huge amount of intimacy and beyond just the re respect for the artistry, a, a, an affection. Two guys who just liked each other. Ah, oh, man, I mean, I I had like a front row seat to that. It was, it was extraordinary. Like the guy, went so deep. I've never seen an actor go as deep and work so hard. Like before we'd even started the movie, he had worked so hard. He was able to like riff as Kingsley and then just seamlessly start riffing as Bob, speaking Patois and then go straight back into Kingsley. And it was like the seamless and it wasn't lines from the movie. He would just be like improvising and riffing and he didn't speak Patois before. So it's like, that's a huge achievement, you know? He, and that's not a, like, we realized that it's not a dialect, like it's a language and he managed to sort of Ugh, it was incredible, and and it was more than just the kind of voice and the, the language. It was physicality, the singing, um, and most importantly, like he he embedded himself in the Marley family. And you know, we had the blessing of having Ziggy and Neville Garrick on set with us every day. And Kingsley just went and loved that family, and they loved him. And I think, you know, they imbued him with the sort of message and spirit of Bob. And I really do think he channeled something quite quite magical. Um, it was very. It was a privilege to be to be to be there front front row seat. Well, well the little birds for me is a beautiful scene, and when he's reassurance, I guess as well with those kids, you know, when they're like they're driving along, and he's like, anyway, yeah, reassurance. Like, what? It, this is love. Oh, I mean, I mean, love. <laughs> what can I say? I've got so much to say about jamming. Joy. That was my favorite scene to shoot, jamming. Um, revolution. Could you be loved? Um, the unity, one love again. I mean, it's all, it's all on one, one brand, isn't it? I mean, I was definitely a kid. Um, my dad was a musician himself uh, when he wasn't an attorney. <laughs> uh, he always had music in the house. Uh, he thought he was Barry White, so he was always singing and, and all of that. But we always had Bob. Uh, we always had Bob in our house. And for sure, he named me Ronaldo Marcus Green after Marcus Garvey, who Bob studied. So from my birth certificate, Bob's been in my life. And, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah. A staple, man, a staple. It's like you can't be in a black household and not have Bob. Um, at least that's how I felt. And um, I also felt that importance when making the film. When the film came to me, I was like, I don't know, man, doing Bob. Like, I don't know if I want to touch that. That's perfect, mm -hmm. you know. And, and um, so, yeah, I, f I felt that from very early on. And uh, I love Bob. I love Bob's music. And um, yeah, it was important for us to try to get it right. Yeah, you know, I wasn't I wasn't necessarily a, a musical biopic person, and as much as I respect those films and respect the performances in those films, they weren't really the kind of movies that I ever thought I'd be making. Um, uh, so when Bob came, it was just different. Like I, I, I realized that there hadn't been a Bob movie made, and Bob was like un unlike any of those other musicians too. So, you know, he was the guy on T-shirts and bu buttons and bags, but like. 
who is he? I didn't really know much, you know, but like a real life superhero without a cape, like a Black Panther, man, it was cool. Like it was, he just had that Che Guevara type thing going on. And, and for me, it was like leaning into that. It was like, okay, who, who's the man, who's the man behind this music? Um, that's cool. And then what type of movie, what's the tone of this film? Um, you know, I'm thinking of f films like City of God and Black Orpheus and Amoros Peros and the movies that I love, which are raw and, and you know, political without being political. And, and so it was just, it was just, okay, if the studios align with the kind of movie that I'm at least setting out to make, then maybe that's a great starting point. And then having the family's involvement was everything that was paramount to me. And so on my very first call with, you know, was with the Ziggy and, and Bob Title and knowing that the family was involved, that we had the music, the rights to the music, I was like, whoa, like, where has this movie been? And why me? You know, why Ray Green? And Ziggy had said, uh, you know, he had seen a short film of mine called Stone Cars that I shot in South Africa. And I was like, oh, you, weren't, you don't want to talk about King Richard? He wanted to talk about this little short film that I shot with no lights and no money. And I was like, okay, we, we see eye to eye uh, about what we're trying to do here. We're making a, a foreign language film with no subtitles. Um, that's, a different, that's a different approach to any of these movies that I've ever seen before. And so that was the starting point, was just like, okay, we're trying to make something a little different, you know, you know, just coming in through the side door instead of the front door, so to speak. And, and, and that was my way in. You know, I, I was born the year that Bob died, and so I never got to see him in concert. I never got to see him perform. So I wanted the film to feel like a VIP ticket into that process. Like, what was that like when they were making music in the bedroom or rehearsing? Uh, what was that like? And so we were able to write those scripts. We were, we were able to write it in, into the movie. Um, kudos to Zach, Zach Balin and helping me crack the structure of the film. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that was the process for me, for sure. I mean, look, you, you want to avoid any tropes. You, you can't, always, can't always do that. You want to subvert expectations. Uh, you know, you want to surprise people. Um, so yeah, you, you don't want to do anything that feels, look, I love Cool Runnings, one of my favorite movies as a kid. I wasn't trying to do that with this movie. Y you know, you don't want to, if Bob Marley was walking around, yeah, man, you, you know, we might have issues. You know, I wasn't trying to make that movie. You know, I was trying to make something that was authentic and real to Bob and true to that. And so, and I know we all were, it wasn't just, it wasn't just myself, you know, the actors, uh, they, they held themselves in high regard. And, and, and demanded it, it was amazing. And we all demanded it, we demanded excellence of each other. Uh, that's what filmmaking is all about, is hiring the best of the best to try to get the best of the best and pushing each other to the limits. And that's what filmmaking is. And so yeah, we tried to avoid any trope that we possibly could. Um, you can't always avoid it, it's filmmaking. Some of them are, are there for a reason and they work. Uh, there are conventions that work for a reason. And so yeah, if we come into the convention, it's how you come into it. And so. You know, we use it where we can, we, we do it when we can, but we, we, we try to make certain scenes intimate. And, you know, how do you make an intimate movie that's also huge in scale? You know, something that feels as, as small as it does big. You know, we made a big movie that feels tender and, and, and caring and loving. Um, and that's not easy to do. So, you know, th those were the things we were trying to achieve with this film. This is love. Could you be loved? Shot the sheriff.